Fido is walking with a head tilt. You may want to consider doing an MRI or a CT scan. How much is that? Well, that's X number of dollars. I can't afford that. So we have to be able to work with our clients and our pets. Now, okay, okay, fine. You know, you can't afford the CT scan. I completely understand that. But here's some other options that we have that aren't going to be as expensive. They may not be able to give us the same answers, but we can work with that. You know, I've been a veterinarian for a long time and I've seen this a number of times. So let's skip this step and go right to here. You just have to trust my experience on this one. So we do have to work with them. And, and again, for me, again, when I wake up in the morning, my goal is to do everything I can to promote that human bond and make it last as long as possible. And sometimes it means you have to kind of take detours. But the goal is the same goal, and that is to keep things going. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, kia ora. Welcome to another episode of the Call the Vet show. We haven't had an interview for a while and today I am delighted to bring you an interview with the wonderful Dr. Doug Maida as we dive into a topic that is absolutely crucial and key to everything that I do as a veterinarian but everything that you do for your pet at home. No matter whether they're a guinea pig which are a part of our family a tortoise or a bird, which are part of Dr. Doug's menagerie, or a more regular dog or cat. We discussed them all today, and this concept is absolutely fundamental. But before I get into that, I hope that you are doing well, and I'm really delighted that you've chosen to spend some time with me again for this episode. Of course, if this is the first time that you're listening, if you're new here, I'd love it if you hit that subscribe button just to make sure that you don't miss out on any future episodes like this wonderful one with Dr. Doug, just to help you understand your pet, to help you care for them to the best of your ability, and ultimately to help them be a part of your family for as long as possible. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, hit that subscribe button. And so with all that out of the way, here is my wonderful conversation with Dr. Doug Maida. Here's this episode's expert interview. Dr. Doug, welcome along to the show. I'm really delighted for you to be joining us today. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation. It's an honor to be with you. And Dr. Doug, you are um, someone who has achieved an awful lot in in your lifetime and still much more to come. I'm sure you're triple board certified veterinary specialist. And so we could be diving into all manner of different uh, medical conditions and weird and wonderful things from, from a health point of view. But I guess today we're really going to be talking a lot about a concept that it actually kind of underpins everything that that we do as vets, but also everything that our listeners and our viewers will do for their pet family at home. And that's the human animal bond. Uh, absolutely. You know, people always ask me why why I became a veterinarian. And at the time I decided to become a veterinarian, I didn't understand the concept or I don't even know if Leo Bustad even came out with the term human animal bond. But it, for me, it's always been about that bond that people have with their pets. And now we know what it's called. And honest to God, the reason I wake up in the morning, my goal, my number one goal is do everything I can to support the human animal bond and prolong it as long as I possibly can. Yeah. So, so what, what, I guess, what is the human animal bond? I mean, it's, it's pr- that relationship between people and their, their animals, but is there more to it than that? What, what is it in a, in a nutshell? Uh, in a nutshell, that's a pretty tough one in a, in a reader's <laughs> digest or, or cliff notes version. I mean, the human animal bond is basically the, the, the American veterinary medical association has a very specific definition for it. And it has to do with the relationship between people and animals and it has to be reciprocal um, we give to the animals, the animals give back to us. But the reality is the human animal bond can be any number of things. It can be um, a young girl with the, playing with her pet kitten. It can be a boy playing fetch with his dog, or it can be um, bird watchers out watching uh, uh, an eagle nest and they see the eagles fly in, build a nest, lay the eggs, the eggs hatch, the eggs, the, the hatchlings fledge and fly away. And there's a bond there. So there's not a lot of give and take, but there is because we enjoy watching the birds and the birds give back to us by an appreciation of nature. So the human animal bond is is really a huge umbrella. Um, in in my world that I live in, I have an unusual background. I'm triple boarded. And one of the things I'm boarded in is, is canine and feline practice. So that little 
young lady with her kitten or the boy playing fetch with his dog is extremely important to me, but I'm also boarded in zoo medicine. And so that eagle, you know, if it gets uh, shot or hits a power line and breaks a wing and I can put it back together again and release it back to the wild, I've promoted that human animal bond. So it's like I say, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. So for people who are, I guess, uh, you know, primarily pet parents that we're talking about today, it's that it's the fact that we call them pet parents as well. That's that's the progression of that human animal bond, I guess. Well, it's yeah, again, it's really interesting, too. Um, if you look at the, the literature, I've seen numbers as high as 90 percent of people that have pets consider them part of the family. And I've tried to track down where that number came from. And it's one of those things where everybody quotes everybody else. Yeah. But the AVMA did a really good survey a few years back where they sent out thousands of, of um, questionnaires. And 36% of all people that have pets consider their pets as child substitutes. So, I mean, that's pretty significant how important that bond is. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, I think of just the other day, I saw someone in my, my clinic and, and they people get very vulnerable with us in the consult room as well, don't they? And that, you know, they they said to me, well, we can have children. And so my dog is is my child. And absolutely. And and the care that they were providing was equivalent to that. And it's it's yeah, it's amazing what people will do for, for their pets. But has that has that changed over time? Has the human animal bond strengthened, if I'm thinking in terms of the role that our pets have in our lives? Has that always been the case or is it becoming more prevalent that people are, are seeing them as family do you feel i think so and i think covid um really put a big push on that because it forced people to stay home which increased that human animal bond time and so people spent a lot more time around their pets it was really interesting um digressing momentarily because i i'm also in practice like you are and our numbers uh, our client numbers actually shot up because people were home with their pets more and they started noticing things that they didn't see when they were at work all day long. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh my gosh, Fido has a, you know, a bump on his ear or, you know, um, Sophie is limping and I never noticed that before. And so our, our, our actual client visits increased with the human, uh, with, uh, with COVID. So I do think it has picked up. And now that people are going back to work, that bond is still there. And so now we're seeing some interesting side effects from that. And that is, a lot of species, more more so dogs and cats, um, have what's called separation anxiety, and I'm sure you've seen similar. Uh, I have a whippet, and they're like the classic. If you look up separation anxiety, the poor guy. When I leave for work, he gets so freaked out. And you know, having been home quite a bit and working from home, and then now going back to work, um, he gets really stressed out. So I, but I do think it's become more important because. Um, you know, the world is changing and things are getting expensive and, and pets don't really cost a lot other than their basic care. You don't have to take them to ball games. You don't have to go on fancy vacations with them. They're perfectly happy going for a walk down the street with you at the end of the day. And if you've had a crappy day, you know, nothing better than having that pet wag the tail when you walk in the door, you know? Yeah, for sure. So I guess that, you know, that, and that goes back to it being a mutually beneficial relationship that, oh, yeah. that bond works both both ways what kind of benefits do people get from having pets in their lives wow we don't have time for all of it but, <laughs> i mean there have been some really great studies that have published that show that pets lower blood pressure um for instance a really interesting one i just read was that um children that grow up with pets are less likely to have uh, add um people that have had heart attacks if you've had a pet cat you have a 40% greater chance of living a year longer than people who have had heart attacks and don't have, don't have pet cats. I mean, I could just go on and on and on. The medical benefits are, are pretty impressive. And another classic one, or in maybe where you live, uh, people that live in rural areas that have farm animals, children are less likely to grow up with allergies than people that live in the city. So it's, I mean, it's just the benefits that pets bring to humans are just amazing. Yeah. Is there a negative cost to treating them as family or believing that they are family or, or them being our family? You know, I, I, my sister is a marriage family and child counselor, and she would argue that, no, there's no negative cost. And, and, you know, what I've read and the people that I've talked to, the courses that I've taken, um, I guess the only thing that, 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 that might be an issue is when you have a pet that is so near and dear to your heart, when it passes, you go through the same stages of grief, the same five stages of grief that would use if, if you went through losing a friend, a family member, something like that. And so, yeah, that hurts. I mean, I'm sure yeah. you've had pets that have passed away in your lifetime. I, I'm, I'm in my mid sixties. I think I'm on my 
fifth generation of dogs since I was a kid. And every time I lose one, it tears a little piece of my soul away, you know, but that's just a sad part of life. And that's, that's something I think that we're all willing to gamble just so that we can still have that opportunity to be with animals. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't get all the good times without having a, you know, that potential yeah, down downside is, is the payment for all of that benefit that they bring to our lives. I guess, uh, you know, thinking of children and analogies, but I've, I've also read that children who suffer the loss of a pet in their life, and that could be their pet mouse, you know, pet goldfish, it doesn't matter what it is, actually are much more resilient and able to cope with stresses later on in life because they kind of learn those coping strategies at that stage. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's a circle of life. And I think teaching children that when they're young and hiding it from them, I think is a big mistake. And teaching it when they're young as, as uh, bitter of a pill as it may be to swallow, I think it's an extremely important part of growing up and learning so that when things like happen, like that happen as you get older, you're more able to cope with it. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, we yeah, we've, we we had a couple of guinea pigs, and we actually lost one of our guinea pigs over over the New Year period. And yeah, my daughter was 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 devastated, and and to oh, see her going to through that. that was, you know, was not very nice. But I know that you know it's it's a very valuable lesson for her, and in it's in a way, it was a good a good reminder for me of the you know the value that all creatures, great and small, have have in our life, and. um yeah as difficult as that that was but um yeah it it is what it is i guess um and, and i guess the other thing i've read is that actually people will grieve their pet more strongly than some family members in a lot of cases that's true and where it becomes real difficult is people that don't have pets don't understand that yeah so if if somebody loses a pet and then they need to take a personal day off work Sometimes their colleagues give them a hard time about it because like, it's just a, it's just a dog. Get another yeah. one. It's like, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. If you lost a child, you're not going to say, it's just a kid. You can always have another one. You know, that's callous. Well, yeah. if you lose a pet, it's just as significant it is to many people as losing a child. And so, yeah, that can be difficult. Yeah, for sure. But uh, you, you brought up a point. So let me just share this with you. And actually, maybe I brought it up about having a fifth generation of pets. Um, of dogs i'm still on my first generation of bird and first generation of tortoise <laughs> i mean <laughs> re reality is i've got one pet tortoise named tracy i think she's 57 and i i fully expect i'll have to find a home for her when i'm long gone so yeah she might be saying she's yeah. on her second or third generation of human of, of humans <laughs> exactly right <laughs> um thinking then of the just kind of how we can care for our pets and how this this bond affects the care for our pets I wonder, and this is something that I've been thinking about recently, is there actually a, a potential negative to the health of our pets because of this strong bond, because of treating them as family, as little people? And I'm thinking here in terms of the way that we maybe model, mollycoddle them, we're, we're overfeeding and, and the obesity epidemic and maybe some of the stimulation that, that we're, we're giving to our our pets did is that something that you you know you think about or um yeah i guess comments on that yeah, actually that that's a really good question but it's quite complex so let me break mm. it down into some of the parts um i don't think we can overshow affection um I, that's just my own opinion yeah um where we get into trouble is when nutrition and you brought that up you hit that nail right on the head and that's where the people who have their spaghetti dinner and they have something left over or they make a little extra for Fido. Last thing in the world we should be doing is feeding them people food. Um, you know, obesity is a huge, huge problem in pets, whether it's dogs and cats, tortoises, birds, anything. Um, we have a tendency to overfeed them. Um, and that's not good, just like it isn't good for 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 people. Um, I mean, there have been some several really good studies published in the veterinary journals how Keeping a dog, you know, if you use the scale of uh, one to nine, one being super skinny, nine being morbidly obese, and five is perfect. If you keep a dog around a four to four and a half, you can add a year or more to their life by just keeping them trim and fit. You know, it's the same thing with people. Um, and then the other thing that we see, and it's from my perspective, wearing one of my other hats, not dogs and cat hats, with exotic pets, is that we we have a tendency to feed them the way we think they should eat as opposed to what they actually really should be eating. And the pet that comes to mind right away, and I, sh I should put that word in, in quotation marks, are people who keep primates as pets. So let me preface that by saying I do not uh, endorse keeping primates as pets. But 
people that do tend to make them child substitutes and tend to feed them as humans. And man, they all get overweight and they all end up getting diabetic. Um, so yes, we can definitely hurt them by loving them too much. Yeah. So, but it's just a way of, yeah, not by giving them too much affection as long as it's the right kind of affection and we're recognizing i guess it, it comes for recognizing them as the species that they are rather than the human substitute and providing for their species specific needs right and you know what people forget that you don't have to give a dog a, a, a dog treat um to reward them dogs are perfectly happy with a pat on the head and an attaboy you know and i love you um you know and and that that's all they need. That's all they want. They just want that attention. And so every time you go and throw them a dog going, yeah, they love it. Of course they do. But that's not good for them. But the attaboys are great for them. And, yeah. and the attaboys are going to keep them healthy. Yeah. And a lot of the time they'd actually probably prefer that if if they're not getting that that stimulation, that interaction with you. And we're using Absolutely. we're using treats and food because we're time poor and we're busy and, and we're not oh, giving I them love that, that attention. Term. Yeah. That's a great term. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So I guess we've spoken about all creatures great and small, and that's a really nice segue into into your book that you've got there, and the vets at Noah's Ark, because you know you've been it's been described as uh, kind of the James Herriot um, of of America, and maybe bringing that story up to date. That's uh, 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 James Herriot is is a series of books. If you've not read them, that is definitely well worth a read. They're, they're fantastic, but they're about a a vet in in Yorkshire at the start of the previous century and, and and life in practice, which has changed an awful lot. And from the green kind of, you know, North Yorkshire Dales to really the, the gritty urban area in LA where you were practicing, there's a big difference there, but perhaps there's not such a big difference in the stories and the the people that you were seeing. You know, it. thank you for bringing that up. I, I, if one of the most humbling comments that I've received from the literary critics is that, uh, the vet at Noah's Ark is the first American James Harriet, which to me is the ultimate compliment because, I mean, that's why I got into veterinary medicine. When I was in high school, I was a blacksmith and I was working with a veterinarian and he he gave me this book called All Creatures Great and Small. And, you know, obviously written by James Harriet. And like, James Harriet's just a phenomenal storyteller, just the, the consummate writer. Um, and I read the book and I just like, oh my God, I, I just need to read more. And then I, I found out he had a whole series. So I read the whole series and that's definitely what sealed the deal for me and why I went to veterinary school. And I was kind of hoping one day that I would be able to do a James Harriet. And so it's taken me 40 years, but now I've got lots of great stories under my belt and I've been writing for the last 40 plus years. And I was able to pen this version of it. And what's really interesting, you brought up the point, um, you know, the common thread is the human animal bond. And I've gone back and I've reread some of his books. And now here in the United States, PBS, which is public broadcasting stations, they've done a series and they they actually have a, a TV show now called All Creatures Great and Small. And it's kind of fun to watch because the same stories that he had with his clients 70 years ago, I have with my clients today. You know, it's the woman who feeds her dog too much, or it's the client who doesn't want to pay their bill, or it's the, you know, you stay up all night long trying to save the horse and no matter what you do, it dies. And, and that's, that that's just uh it's it's it, it, the same stories they're they're forever they're ever, ever true you know and it, it doesn't matter what country or where or what part of town or what race what nationality what religion you are people love their pets and people have the same issues you know that same bond for sure i think we all have our own tricky woo that we can think of and, and, and the <laughs> like. if yeah, you've read the book you'll know who the, you'll know who that is oh absolutely yeah and, and i mean i guess you saw you know, a real diverse range of of society. I, I practice in an area where, again, we, we see, um, you know, the very wealthy people to people who are really struggling to provide the bare necessities for their own life. And but but that doesn't affect the care that they well, the care that they want to give their pets. And actually, I find sometimes the people with less want to do the most. Um, mm -hmm. But that bond is still the same. Yeah. Well, where we were, we were kind of in a really unique place in the city and i mean literally on the cusp between a extremely affluent neighborhood and then the one of the worst parts of the inner city and the governor of california at the time was one of my clients and then i had people that would come into my practice and they could barely afford shoe, uh, shoes for their children but they would want everything they could do for their 
you know, that was necessary to save their pets. And I guess you could call me a bad businessman because I can honestly say in my lifetime, I've never turned anybody away. And if somebody really wants to make an effort to take care of their pets, I would do everything I could, no matter what it costs, to try and help them do that. And I mean, there are people who would give away five dollars of their paycheck every week just to try and pay off their vet bill. And you know, again, it's that's how important animals are to people. Yeah, yeah. Have you got? I guess seeing you know seeing that, and and I'm thinking that you know our current situation is the the cost of living across the world is climbing. You know, the costs of everything is climbing we've also got a situation where in veterinary medicine the the gold standard care is is climbing but the cost of providing that that top level best in inverted commas care is also climbing so many people are are, are struggling to afford the care that they would perhaps want for their pet or they aspire to have you got any you know thoughts that would maybe help people kind of navigate this you know very challenging situation that we find ourselves in I do. And that's an extremely important point. And I think, as you said, there are people who want to do everything they can for their pet, but not, can't necessarily afford it. And then they, they have that guilt yeah. and they shouldn't feel that, you know, it's, um, you never want to have to, you never want to put a person in a position where they have to feel guilt because they can't provide the proper care. Um, we have always in my practice made it a point to try and work with everybody, whether it's through, um, credit funds or we have several what we call angel funds which are nonprofit organizations that help out uh people in need we help people with uh getting funds on the internet um so that guilt thing is something that's real everybody feels it but it's certainly something that you shouldn't be ashamed of um the the, the thing that we're pushing a lot now here in the states is pet insurance um, I don't know if they ha- they offer that where you live, but um, I think the last I just did an article on it, and the last count there were like 22 pet insurance companies, and it, it's a whole it's like a buffet line. You can go in and you can get the salad, you can get the salad with the ham, or you can get the salad with the macaroni. I mean, there's a whole uh, menu of options that are available from basic accident coverage or illness coverage or accident and illness coverage all the way up to well care plans which cover vaccines. Um, you know, spays and neuters, normal dentistry. So there's a whole variety of things out there. And I am encouraging every, our, my hospital encourages every client that comes in now to get pet insurance because it's like anything else. I live in the Florida Keys. I live on an island. Okay. I've been paying into hurricane insurance for the last 30 years. And a couple of years ago, we got hit by a hurricane. You know, I would rather pay it and never ever have to cash in on it, but it's nice to know that it's there and when you need it. Pet insurance is the same way. Uh, If you have the pet insurance, it might mean the difference between can I get my dog fixed that's in heart failure or was hit by a car or do I have to say goodbye and make that tough decision? So um, I'm, I'm really encouraging people now to get pet insurance. I think it's a real smart move. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, coming from the UK, where pet insurance is actually really, you know, very popular, um, and I'm thinking the last clinic I worked at was probably about fifty percent plus of of clients. Um, oh, and it is, yeah, and it's slowly making, uh, yeah, making inroads here in New Zealand as well. With you know, I, I think ten years ago people looked at me funny when I said pet insurance, and now everyone's heard of it. They certainly don't have it by any means, but you know, that conversation yeah. is, is is coming, and it's got a great role. But I, I love that 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 talk of guilt and you know people shouldn't feel guilty and i think you know the level of care that that people are providing for themselves if i think of dental care you know i I read about the cost of you know insulin over in the states and and diabetics struggling to provide their care we you know my personal opinion is that we can't expect our pet parents to be able to provide in every single situation the level of care that actually that they're not able to afford themselves sometimes as well right yeah, so and the, be- the the concept of guilt goes both ways because it's also difficult on veterinarians yeah. because you know we're trained to offer the Mercedes Benz and you 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 can't profile your clients just because they come in and they've got dirty clothes and they drive an old car you can't just automatically assume they can't afford care so we have to offer everybody the best possible care and that can be sticker shock okay. You know, Fido is walking with a head tilt. We may want to consider doing an MRI or a CT scan. How much is that? Well, that's X number of dollars. I can't afford that. So we have to be able to work with 
our clients and our pets. Now, okay, okay, fine. You know, you can't afford the CT scan. I completely understand that. But here's some other options that we have that aren't going to be as expensive. They may not be able to give us the same answers, but we can work with that. You know, I've been a veterinarian for a long time and I've seen this a number of times. So let's skip this step and go right to here. You just have to trust my experience on this one. So we do have to work with them. And, and again, for me, again, when I wake up in the morning, my goal is to do everything I can to promote that human bond and make it last as long as possible. And sometimes it means you have to kind of take detours. But the goal is the same goal, and that is to keep things going. For sure. And I think that, that to me, speaks of the art of veterinary medicine, the elusive art right. of veterinary medicine that you know that James Herriot was a, a master of. And I'm sure the stories oh, in your, in, in your <laughs> book show that, that you, you are as well, is helping navigate this very difficult journey when this bond is so strong and you know you want to do as much as you can but there's different competing yeah elements to that as well yeah uh, it sure can be difficult yeah fantastic well dr doug this has been a, a a wonderful conversation where can people go to to get your book or to find out more about the the wonderful work that that, that you do uh, I have several social media sites. Uh, if you're interested in getting my book, my website is www.dougmater.com. So it's real simple. Um, Amazon sells the book World Ride. I, I don't know about New Zealand, but I do know that they're selling it in Australia. So I suspect it's probably yeah. the same. Um, so those are two sources to get the book. And then I also have a Facebook page, Douglas Mater, and then an Instagram page, Doug Mater. And uh, you can kind of follow along and uh, enjoy my travels and my work with dogs and cats and kangaroos and alligators and a little bit of all the stuff I do. It's a lot of fun. I love being a veterinarian. I love what I do and I love sharing it with people. Fantastic. It really is all creatures great and small. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Doug. I'll leave all of those links in the show notes for everyone listening so that they can yeah order their copy of the book and follow along in whatever, whatever platform they prefer. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been wonderful to chat. I, again, it's such an honor to be with you and thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to visiting you uh, down in New Zealand someday. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve. <laughs> Now, I've put in my order for Dr. Doug's book. Uh, If it's even remotely as good as the James Herriot's, then it's definitely worth a read. And I'm sure it is just as good like the reviews are coming through as you can find all of those links again in the show notes or at callthevet.org, where you can also find out how to follow on with everything else that Dr. Doug is getting up to. And then finally, it's been great to uh, share some time with you again this week. Uh, If you have enjoyed this show, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with two or three of your pet owning friends or family, it helps me spread the word, help to reach more people and ultimately help to impact and improve the life of pets no matter where they are in the world. So thank you in advance for that. And until the next episode, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet show because they're family. That's it for this episode of The Call the Vet Show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.